All right, everyone, welcome back. I hope you're all well and safe. This is lecture 24, part one. Um, we're gonna talk more about PC and the HD era, and specifically today, we're gonna talk about free to play. Uh, ben Cousins, whose presentation you watched, When the Consoles Die, What Comes Next from GDC, uh, also is a big proponent of free to play. And he had this quote from 2012, the next generation of freemium or free to play games will be indistinguishable from AAA games. Uh, and to some extent, that's true depending on the genre and type of thing he's talking about. So in these free to play games, and we talked about this on mobile and the issues with transparency and uh, pay to win kind of things. So in free to play, the core base game is free to play and income is then generated through these microtransactions. Uh, on PC games, they often take a form of things like character purchases. So you can buy uh, characters you wanna keep playing or extra slots for characters in a role playing game. Things like having character skins or particular in-game items, the cosmetics, things that make your version of a wizard different from Sally's version of a wizard. They also often sell things like uh, progress enhancers, XP boost level games, expansion packs, extra content, things like that. And this model has grown very quickly since uh, the HD era. So this quote's from 2012. So in the past decade, this has really grown or eight years, or not quite a decade, has grown really quickly. And particularly for games that are online-centric, so massively multiplayer online RPGs, RTS games, real-time strategy games, first-person shooter games. Uh, it's in every genre, but particularly in the ones that focus on multiplayer, or simultaneous multiplayer online, free-to-play has become much more um, sort of uh, distributed. Uh, some advantages of free-to-play. Uh, for, for us as consumers, it's great. It's free. We can try it out, see if we like it. If so, we can keep playing it. If not, we'll just go on to something else. It eliminates piracy concerns, particularly since most of these games take place online. You're playing on the company server. And if, if you want to download the client software or the game, uh, pirate away, right? They're not making any money off of selling you the game. It's the stuff in the game that makes the money for them. So there's no piracy, right? You can't steal what's free. Uh, the games get a longer life cycle, right? You can always make more content. You can make more characters, more costumes, more swords, more levels, more story chapters. So it extends, potentially expand, extends the life cycle of a game. In the long run, these can be much more lucrative than the traditional model, right? The traditional model of games had been sell a hit game. It's the hot game for a while. Then you might buy a game of the year edition a little bit later. And then that's pretty much all the sales you get out of it over time. You still get sales, thinking about digital distribution, the long tail to continue, but you're not going to get that big rush of sales right off the bat. Whereas with this model, there's you, you sort of have these web ebbs and flows, right? New content comes out, everyone plays it and churns it. New content comes out, everyone plays it and churns it. And so it just keeps it going. The other advantage is that you're no longer reliant on traditional retail to sort of get your game going, right? Retailers have very little incentive to promote free-to-play games since they don't make any money off the initial sale. Um, they do sell off the value cards, and that's a positive for, a positive for them. And it lets the games have a little bit of retail presence, particularly on the PC side where everything's gone digital. So low barrier of entry for us, no piracy for the developer. Longer lifecycle game can be very, very lucrative. You can think about things like Fortnite and PUBG and Overwatch that have now been going on for quite a while. There are some disadvantages to these style, this style of game development, though, and, the, and this sort of game Right? The success of the game depends on the in-game purchases. Right, If you like one of these free-to-play games, but it doesn't find an audience fast enough or people don't buy enough stuff, then it just it's not going to last very long. Uh, sometimes these give the perception of being a cheap game or lower quality, right? Why you know, we're suspicious of things that are free. Um, you risk backlash from consumer if they feel, particularly on PC, if people feel like you're either doing pay to win or you're constantly kind of nickel and diming to keep playing. Um, it's kind of a quick way to have your MMORPG fail, basically. Uh, again, the higher this is a very high level of competition. Again, you're not competing with the Red Dead Redemptions 2 and the Spider-Mans and Gods of War and sort of those top tier uh, single player games. So you're competing, if you're an MMORPG, there's like 12 free ones that are sort of AAA and you're competing with those. If you're an FPS game, you can play Overwatch. If you wanna play Battle Royale, you play Fortnite or PUBG. So a lot of things like that. And again, this the advantage of the retail industry uh, is the this is a disadvantage on this side is that retails like Target and Walmart and stuff don't see the need to carry PC titles that are free to play. So it kind of goes back and forth. 
free to play also has a it's on PC has similarities to a different business model, which is known as software as a service, or it's called SaaS. And this is a model that you see here at IU. We license software instead of owning it. We subscribe to a service as opposed to just outright buying products. And this really works on online games. So if you think about things like Canvas or Salesforce or things that are or Microsoft Office 365, where IU provides you a subscription to it, um, that's software as a service, right? They get a set amount of money constantly in a subscription model. Um, on a lot of the free to play games use this sort of model, right? Uh, if I have a subscription to a uh, free to play game, I'll get content updates, you know, I'll get all the enhancements uh, for game developers of potential higher revenue. The disadvantage of this is, you know, the software depends on the server, right? If the game closes down and you've spent a thousand dollars, you're out of luck. Uh, the other issue that often crops up in these games is that you have no control over the data or content that you give up when you're playing them. So uh, Fortnite, for example, might track all your movements across a map or, re or identify you demographically in order to try to market better to you using an algorithm. And you have almost no control over that. You sign all of that away when you install the end user license agreement. But this idea that a game, games as a service or game as a subscription um, is very lucrative, right? Because I'll stay in your game longer. I might spend a little extra money on it. Uh, there's a lot of interesting um, potential here for different revenue models and different models of game development. So we're seeing that the, the enterprise software model has already sort of moved to this model and we're starting to see it now in the AAA game space a little bit. So just something to be aware of. The biggest difference in the economics of a traditional game versus a free-to-play game is that the games, the free-to-play games have to generate income from the microtransaction. And as a result, some game designs really entice players to purchase items that provide in-game advantage. This, often refer, this is often referred to as pay to win, and gamers generally do not like this. Um, you can also design your game to force players to spend money if they want to keep playing or if they want to get to the next level or whatever it is. And that's often seen as sort of a, a negative. Um, generally, if a free-to-play game feels balanced and fair, people seem to, they do really well. If, people, if it seems like it's sort of shoehorning you into making purchases or deliberately forcing you to make choices by pay by design, then it occasionally has some issues. And a lot of this depends on the popularity of the game and how fun it is and that kind of stuff. And that's sort of an individual taste. Team Fortress 2 is an interesting example because this was a traditional team-based uh, first-person shooter game. It came out around 2000, I want to say five, six, seven, sometime in there. I don't remember the exact year. But in 2011, they, they switched it over to free to play. After they made that transition, the revenue from the game was 12 times what they had been selling monthly copies of the games. Uh, Valve did not get a lot of blowback for this. They make a very important distinction between free to play and pay to win. Uh, Valve is the same company that makes Half Life, and they own Steam, the digital distribution platform for PC. And then the other examples that have used this model are Tribes of Sin, Plant Side 2 Hawk, and Destiny 2 now uses this, uh, Overwatch, uh, Battle Royale, Fortnite, PUBG, all that, FPS games, a lot of the online, Counter-Strike Go, all use this model. You can see their revenue streams jumping up in 2011 as they go free to play, and then it just cranks way up as they have in-game events. So just kind of a visual representation of what we just talked about. Almost all the MMORPGs are free to play. They've switched off subscription. World of Warcraft lets you uh, play free up to like level 20, but Lord of the Rings Online, DC Universe Online, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, there's a whole bunch of these and they just do better. You can see in this little graphic, in terms of average play time, after they go free to play, people engage in it a lot more. And as customers engage in it a lot more, or as gamers engage in it a lot more, they're much more likely to make purchases, whether that be character slots or, or, or uh, cosmetics or content or whatever it is. Uh, you see this model in other games like World of Tanks. Some of the real-time strategy games now embrace this model. Um, even some of the strategy, turn-based strategy games like Crusader Kings from Paradox Interactive have a free-to-play version. So you're seeing this sort of proliferate along amongst these online games. One of the biggest issues that comes up in free-to-play both across console and mobile is that there's a, generally these make their money from a fairly small percentage of people who spend a lot of money that are, that are referred to as whales. So I like, let's say I really like Overwatch. Um, so I'll buy a lot of um, currency. Overwatch is not free to play. I'm sorry, that's a bad, I apologize. I've been using that example. It's not a good one. Let's say I like, a, I, I like Team Fortress 2 a lot and I end up buying a lot of the equipment or the towering pillar of hats, things like that. And so there's this like, you know, if your user base is, your user base for free to play game is like, 
a million and a hundred thousand people are spending money and out of the hundred thousand there's probably ten thousand people who are spending a lot of money and those people are whales and that's who you're trying to find when you're designing these games to get them to keep feeding money into your game and that kind of raises the question of ethical game design you know is it ethical to design your game specifically to attract these whales right uh, ben cousins talked about this in his talk uh, on this topic and you know are the free activities valuable with while are the essential activities behind a pay barrier are you using time sinks to encourage payment right are you making people grind and grind and grind and grind to get to level two when they could just give you two bucks and get straight to level two and then the other question that comes up is does releasing the game free justify the design that you use to make revenue and the game industry hasn't really answered these questions this is sort of in flux um, some games seem to be doing very well with this model. Some game and gamers seem to like it. Fortnite's probably the biggest example, right? Um, and then there are other companies, and there's certainly stuff in the mobile space that seems very, you know, very much shoehorned into design to get you to purchase more items. So, you know, as gaming, in the, as gaming particularly as free-to-play style grows, you know, do game designers need a code of ethics or guidelines similar to other industries? Right. This is an interesting question. The example I would often give in class is if you go to Las Vegas and you're a compulsive gambler and you have a problem, they have a thing in every casino, like this big sign that says, if you have a problem, call this number. And you can call and tell the casino, I can't control myself. Don't let me in there. And if you walk in, their really wicked, nice facial recognition software catches you to very nice, very well-dressed, very large and scary gentlemen will escort you off the premises. Right. And Vegas does that because they want to put forth a good face like, hey, we're an ethical business, even though we're gambling, we're not going to just have compulsive gamblers come in here and lose their houses. And so the question becomes when game design goes to this free to play model very heavily. And again, this is this is now just PC, mobile. It's on smart TVs, tablets everywhere. How are you going to how is the game industry going to at least give the appearance or at least uh, guidelines for game development in order to keep this free-to-play model going and to keep it from seeming uh, legitimate as opposed to, you know, as opposed to, gam you know, as opposed to gambling with like loot boxes or um, having to grind games like Madden to do ultimate team, things like that. So again, just some questions that arise out of this business model. This business model is very lucrative. It's very successful and you're going to see it a lot, particularly uh, on multiplayer online games. So that's it for part one. We'll come back with part two for lecture 24 and I'll see you there. Take care.